Well, thanks very much. It's really a pleasure and honor to be here. I'm glad to see lots of people showing up. Uh, Miguel Mon, it's that those are tall shoes to fill, but uh, I'll do my best. So, my background is in the physics of disordered systems, glasses, and other amorphous solids. And superficially, that looks very far from the topic of, of uh, this talk. And but there are some connections that I'll make along the way. Although really, the, the study of language from a physicist's point of view has not really been explored very much at all. So I think it's a kind of new territory that, that is there. And uh, I think of topical interest as I'll, I'll try to explain. So can you hear me in the back if I just speak normally? Yes? OK. OK, so as I'm sure that most of you are aware that in the past decade, there's been massive successes of, of machine learning and problems that traditionally have been considered uh, extremely hard such as speech recognition and image recognition. And the buzzword behind all these successes is deep learning or deep neural networks. And if you don't know anything about deep neural networks, you might think that, OK, if, since these problems are so hard, then these, uh, these uh, solutions must involve uh, a huge amount of very complicated details, et cetera. And while, OK, of course, there's a lot of work that's, been, that's gone into these to, to, do, to accomplish the learning. Actually, the, the basic ideas involved are very simple. So first th thing that I want to do is, is just express that to you. So this is a basic neural network uh, as used in machine learning. It's very far from what uh, networks of real neurons do, of course. But that's not really the interest here. So at the simplest level, what you have is just an input layer. So that's your input x, a vector, that's mapped onto some hidden layer y. And that's mapped then again onto some output layer. So Typically, what you want to measure, or sorry, what you want to output are some probabilities, p. And what you have in, in, inside is some internal representation. Now, in more detail, this y, this hidden layer, it's some function of, of your input, ax plus b. So a is a matrix of parameters, and b is a vector of parameters. And the whole goal of learning is to, to choose these parameters well to, to accomplish whatever function you're trying to do. For the purposes of this discussion, it doesn't really matter what that function is. Now, that's a basic neural network. It's the kind of building block of all the deep learning. And when you talk about a deep learning, a deep neural network, it just means that you add several hidden layers. So here, y1 is a function of x with some parameters and offsets. y2 is a function of y1 with some parameters and offsets, and so on. So really, that's the basic architecture. And so far, I haven't told you anything about this function f that's called the activation function. And I think the way to think about it is to, to ask yourself, what happens if I change my input a little bit? How does it affect my output? So let's first consider the trivial case, the linear case. And then obviously, any change in the input in that case will to lead to some change in y. Let me assume that this function g of y that maps y onto the, the output is just some increasing function. Then in that case, all of the elements in the hidden layer here, they're all going to con contribute to the change in, in the probability. So what it means is that if the machine is going to work very well, so it has the answer that you want, then every element in the machine has to know about every possible range, possible type of input you could, you could add. So it's kind of like a referendum machine. Because really, everything has to be an expert about every possible input. Whereas if you consider what happens with the nonlinear function, so even something very, very simple. So nowadays, actually, the most common choice is just this simple clamp here. Actually, just that simple change makes a huge difference. Because now, of course, if for some particular element, the, if the change in the input corresponds to some, to some, to some part uh, over here uh, to the left of the x-axis, then of course, there's no change in the output. So this kind of machine, once it's trained well, Instead, it, you have elements that can be indifferent. The elements don't have to know what to do with every possible input, only about ones that are in their, their kind of range of activation here. So such a machine, once it's trained well, actually behaves more like you have a bunch of experts in some particular range of inputs, which then contribute. So there's really a huge difference between what happens when you have a simple uh, linear function here versus something with a very strong saturation. So, if we put that together, then what it tells you is that really it's very essential to have nonlinear activation. Because once you have saturation in the activation function, then your elements can act compositionally. So 
you have kind of expert elements rather than jack of all trades, which would have to know about every possible input. And it's quite clear intuitively that in that situation, wh what you have is you can save a lot of a lot of parameters because instead of having every input having to know about what to do, sorry, every el hidden element having to know what, what to do with every input, you can be more uh, parsimonious. So one way to think about it is you're approximately factorizing the data space. So you have fewer parameter degrees of freedom you need to, to learn. There, there's a very nice theory that kind of shows this quite explicitly and maps out for a, for a simple neural network what ranges of parameters you can have this by my colleague Remy Monasan, who's here. Uh, and so, well, to sum up, there's a first principle of a successful machine learning that is that you really want composition because you want to have expert elements, not having uh, this kind of more democratic referendum machine. So to see it in action, let me show you uh, this uh, very classic machine learning problem. These are handwritten digits, so they're picture files. And what you want to do is just take the digits and, and output what is the correct number that they correspond to. So nowadays it's considered a, a kind, of, kind of easy problem, but it's very good for testing uh, new architectures. And what you find that once you train a machine, so this machine is, is not exactly what I described to you, but that's not important. What you find is that the hidden units end up corresponding to essentially elementary strokes. So for example, here there's some stroke like this and, and like this. Okay, there are some others doing other, other things. So the compositionality is, is quite clear here. Now, okay, so, oh, sorry, yeah? Yeah, of course, I'm, uh, I'm making a very strong distinction between these extreme cases, and you can have things in between. So you can have a machine like this that will work. It's just it should be harder to train than than this. So well, if that, even if that's true, this kind of machine is what people are using typically nowadays, right? This. The, the, this thing, the RELU, is what is, seems to be the most popular nowadays as component of the... I, I can't hear, sorry. Okay, sure. So, so composition seems to be a, a key component of successful machine learning. Now, that's something that you can apply it just at the simple neural network. Now what happens if you add multiple layers? Then what you find happens is that you seem to learn different types of features at, at different layers. So here's a machine that was trained to recognize uh, faces. At, at the first level, it's similar to what we saw with the digits, that you have some kind of elementary shapes. Whereas at the next, the next uh, hidden layer, higher one up, then you start to see uh, features that are, are more complicated at a higher level, and, and so on. For here, we have kind of basic templates of faces. So what we see empirically is that once you have a deep neural network, you start to represent hierarchical features. And there are some theoretical work that's showing that with this kind of network, you can represent functions with very far fewer parameters. But I would say that uh, this is largely empirical in this case. And empirically, it seems that deeper is better. So a few years ago, there was this network, uh, Google Net, that was used for image recognition. Where here, each of these blue boxes is a basic neural network. And here, the depth was on the order of 30. Whereas nowadays, I understand that there are, there are deep neural networks being used by the companies that have something like a thousand, uh, a depth of a thousand, so much, much bigger. So there seems to be a second principle of successful machine learning that, that hierarchy is really uh, uh, helping to solve very difficult problems. Now. Then in, this, in the, the paradigm of neural networks, at least as the architecture is concerned, there are these two aspects that are quite important. But so far, I haven't said anything about the actual training, which is uh, actually not so simple. So I don't want to get into it too much, but let's just consider the simplest scenario, which is supervised learning. Then in that case, what it means is that you have some 
some training data where you have pairs of the input and the output that you know exactly and that you wanted to use to help build the machine. So then what you can do is define some energy function, which is a function of the parameters that you don't know, of what you get if you pass your, your, your input data through the machine minus the output that you know. And then you can, you can square it or use something similar. It, it doesn't really matter. Then it's quite clear that what you want to do is, is lower the energy. This is a disordered physics problem because the, the training data is fixed. So you have some fixed energy landscape that's defined by the training data, something like this. And you're trying to find some one of the deep valleys, or at least a valley that's deep enough to get good performance. So roughly speaking, you can try to do gradient descent. And there's all kinds of tricks that are used to really do that better and very efficiently. And what's been observed is that there's a lot of phenomenology associated with this process that, that's very similar to what goes on in classic glassy systems. So there's a lot of people, many of my colleagues, that are trying to understand this learning process and, and try to, to figure out what are the principles for, for learning. So there's one direction of, of work uh, that physicists can contribute to, which is really to try to understand this learning process. But for me, actually, what's more interesting is, is looking at the problems where deep learning is not really successful at all yet. And so in particular, when it comes to natural language processing. So just to remind you that, that as of now, uh, the state of the art systems that we have are really not very close to human intelligence. So usually it's not quantified very well. I found this one uh, challenge that, that is quite nice to illustrate that point. So the way it works is that you have two sentences that are very similar. They only differ in one word. And you take, say, the first sentence, the city councilman refused the demonstrators a permit because they feared violence. And then the question is about who does this pronoun they refer to? And then you do the second sentence, almost the same. The city councilman refused the demonstrators a permit because they advocated violence. And again, you ask who that, that referred to. And OK, for, for humans, it's very simple to know what happens, to what the right answer is. Humans have a performance that's uh, greater than 90% on a series of questions that are, that are quite similar. Some of them are a bit confusing, which is probably why it's not 100%. But you see that, at least as of 2016, for this particular contest, the best performance was 58%. And they even allowed multiple submissions. So you could have just chosen a few variations of uh, like this, the stupidest possible algorithm and done something like that. So it's going to happen again this year, this contest. And so we'll see how much better things have gotten in the past two years. But it's quite clear that this is really uh, not very, very strong performance. So what interests me is, what is the structure that makes these types of questions very easy for us to, to answer, but so far uh, not for the, the deep neural networks? And one way to think of it is a personal goal of mine is really to teach a machine to read and understand a book. And why would I want to do that? Well, the answer is very simple. It's really in these numbers here. These are the number of articles added to PubMed each year. So PubMed, if you don't know, it's the database of all the, essentially all the articles in medical science. And you see it's on the order of a million, a million articles a year and growing. There's no way that a human can read anything close to that, that amount. But if we can teach a machine to read and understand one paper, then it's not very far from that to do 100 papers, 1,000, a million, and so on. So I think I mean, this is the future. And we have to get there one way or the other. OK. So now I want to talk about the structure of language. And the first thing is, why is language something that we can really study with scientific methods at all? Why is it not simply uh, a subset of the humanities? So Chomsky even says that it's a subset of, of physiology. And I'll illustrate it with what I call the rigidity of language. So just take these two sentences, is John the man who is tall? Or is John is the man who tall? And you know right away, absolute, you're absolutely sure that one of those sentences is, gr is grammatically correct, and the other one is not. And not only do you know it, but you're absolutely sure. There's no way that you could, you could ever be convinced that one, uh, the, number, the number two is grammatically correct. And so there's a structure in language that you perceive absolutely immediately once you learn a language. Children, children learn it roughly starting at the age of three. And then the years following that, they, they pick up the syntax very, very, very uh, rapidly. And what you should notice is that to answer that, to know about the grammaticality of the sentence, you don't need to know who John is. 
You don't need to know what is the context in which we might be asking who is tall or not. You really don't need to know any of those things. They're all irrelevant. Before that, you can still answer the question about which one is, gr is grammatical and which one is not. And it was Chomsky who really took this kind of observation and tried to take it and, and use it as a basis to build a theory of language. So he has this famous sentence, colorless green ideas sleep furiously, which you should compare with furiously sleep ideas green colorless. And again, even with these sentences, which absolutely don't even mean anything, this going to, you know, it's, it's absolutely not a correct sentence, uh, strictly speaking, but you can see that it's, gram it's grammatical. And notice with, with four, which is obviously not grammatical, you don't even really know how to read it. If you try to read it, you're, you're, you have kind of a, a flat tone when you read the words. So, so there's really a, a very sharp dis difference between syntax, which is essentially the logical structure within sentences, and semantics, which is what, loosely speaking, we, we consider as meaning or the connection to truth. They're really, uh, in some sense, two separate objects. And Chomsky really emphasized the importance of syntax as something that we that is a, a big part of our understanding. Now, there's one more thing that's illustrated in Chomsky's uh, famous sentence here. It's that even if you take any two of these words that are next to each other, it's highly unlikely that any two of those words would ever appear in any actual real sentence that's ever occurred. You don't talk about green things being colorless, ideas being green, ideas sleeping or somebody sleeping furiously. And notice also that the, the pairwise probability of any of those two, two words appearing next to each other is the same for this sentence as this one. Uh, and yet, three is perfectly grammatical and four is not. So at the time when Chomsky was doing this in the 50s, people were thinking of, of speaking as a kind of Markov process, that you have one word after the other. And he was trying to show with this construct, construct that that's really not the correct way to think about it at all. So, so what is the structure, the syntax? And it was Chomsky who formalized this in the, in the context, context of linguistics. Bacchus was doing something the same in computer science at about the same time. But actually, apparently, there was a, an Indian scholar, Panini, who was, was formalizing the grammar of Sanskrit almost 2,000, or more than 2,000 years ago, along similar lines. So the way that it works is that a, a grammar is a set of string rewriting rules. So it's not the grammar that we talk about in everyday life. It's, it's a more abstract concept. We have two sets of symbols, hidden symbols, which are, are capitalized, and observable symbols, which are, well, which are lowercase. And the way that it works is that you have a start symbol, S, a particular one, and you rep repeatedly apply the rules until you get a string only of observables. And that's the sentence that you end up with. So the best way to understand is with an example. And so here's a simple grammar. It has only three rules. S can become SS, S can become ASB, or S can become AB. And here's an example derivation. S becomes SS, becomes ASBS, et cetera. And in the end, you have this string AABBAB. And it's clear that if I just permute the symbols, then this is equivalent to open, open, close, close, open, close, brackets. So you see that this grammar, it generates well-formed parentheses. And it's quite obvious that not only does it generate some of these strings, but it can generate any possible set of well-closed parentheses, which, are, which of course, is an infinite set. So in general, we say that the language is a set of observable strings. And often, it's, it's infinite, because grammars can implement recursion, which is part of their strength. So you see that. Sometimes you have S appearing on both sides of, of, a, of a rule. Not necessarily S, but some symbol appearing on both sides of the rule. So one thing that I forgot to mention is that uh, throughout the talk, in some cases where I use some word that's a bit loose, then I have a footnote where I have something that's more, more precise. So I won't say them, but they're there if you want to, to read them. OK. Now, because grammars are so powerful, there's really a big class of them. And what, what you can do with them depends uh, on the class. So there's actually a hierarchy called the Chomsky hierarchy that goes from the regular languages, which are quite simple and limited, up to very, very complicated ones. So one way to understand languages is to think that you have a computer, an automaton, that is taking some string made from the language 
and trying to parse it to, to, to build this derivation tree or derivation structure. And then there are different computers that you need depending on the class. So at the simplest level, a regular language, it can be parsed by a finite state automaton. So that's just a computer that goes between some finite number of states. It doesn't even have any memory at all. That's the simplest machine. And then the context-free languages are parsed by an automaton with a stack memory. So remember, a stack memory, a stack is like a pile of heavy plates where you can put as many things as you want on them, but you can only take them off the top. So you can only access at one point. And then next up are the context-sensitive languages. And these ones are an automaton where you have finite memory where you can access it anywhere. And there's even more complicated ones beyond. So that's one way to think about these class of languages. But there's another way, which I think is more, uh, perhaps more concrete. It's just to look at the, what the derivations look like uh, graphically. So here's an example derivation for a regular grammar. So I have, starting from S, I produce this string A, C, X, Y, E. And for regular grammars, what you have is always linear. It's the most structure that you can have, so it's really hardly any structure at all. It sounds like it's not very useful, but in fact, it is used in computer science in, in search patterns. So grep in Linux is short for, for something recur, uh, regular expression uh, parser, I guess. And that's, it seems to be the main use is for, for search patterns and, and things of this sort in computer science. Now, the next level up in the hierarchy are the context-free grammars. And here, derivations generate a tree. And they always generate a tree. So, so these are the ones there. It was introduced uh, by Chomsky in linguistics, and also in computer science by Bacchus and Knorr. And it really plays a, a big role in computer science, although I'm not going to talk about that. So th these are actually the class that, uh, for me, will be of most interest. But w to see what happens if you try to go beyond that to the, to the context-sensitive grammars, then normally you read that actually you can't even graph these at all. So normally you just post just uh, show derivations in a kind of uh, linear fashion. But, but you can draw them if you, pay, if you, if you add, some extra, uh, add some extra lines that indicate the context. So basically what it means is that there is some rule that says that if you have a b here, it can become a little b if you have an a next to it. And that's a rule that's not allowed in a context-free grammar. So the main point is that once you have a context-sensitive grammar, you're not generating a tree anymore. You have something that's some more general graph. OK, and there's even more complicated grammars that I, I won't go into. So all that is a bit abstract. And the main interest for me is, what is the structure of, of natural languages? So this is something that was debated in the literature for quite a long time. Because Chomsky originally proposed that context-free grammars were not, not sufficient. But then it was shown that his examples actually didn't hold up under scrutiny. So it took a long time for this to be settled. And it was really only in the 80s. So like, 25 years after Chomsky had, had his original discussions, where it was really shown that, okay, of the 7,000 or so existing living languages, many of which, of course, have not been studied in, in extreme detail, but many of which have, only two of them have, have confirmed non-context-free features. So Swiss German is one, and Bambara, which is a, a language from Mali, is another. Yeah, I, I won't make any jokes about Swiss German, but... <laughs> uh, okay, so... For me, this is kind of the fundamental fact here. We have a huge ensemble of languages that have been given to us by nature and culture, and essentially all of them are context-free. So they give us this ensemble for natural language syntax. So just to give you an example for, for English, what, what does a derivation tree actually look like? Here's one for the dog saw a man in the park. And so, OK, of course, these are words you know. Many of the symbols in here are things that you know. So n is noun, np is a noun phrase, v is a verb, etc. Although maybe like me, you never took any grammar class in your life, so I never learned any of these things formally, but still I can speak. And okay, of course you're probably wondering what is the, what is the actual meaning of the tree. And so essentially, the, the idea is that if I take this kind of sentence, then when I have the park, and put them together, this actually behaves essentially like park in the way that it combines with other objects. So the park is a noun phrase, and it behaves essentially like a noun. Whereas then, say, the next step up, I have in the park, 
And that, that essentially behaves like in something where it doesn't matter what the something is. So the way that it combines with other, other phrases is just that it's in something. And so really that's, that's the core idea. So linguists say that, that uh, syntax, these kind of context-free grammars, they express the constituency behavior. They tell you about what things are composed of what other things. Okay. So here's another example of, of how rich things can be with a, a Victorian, long Victorian sentence. So this one is from, from Frankenstein. The feelings of kindness and gentleness which I'd entertained, but a few moments before it gave place to hellish rage and gnashing of teeth. And you see that, okay, it, it can be quite rich. So, so we see that in language, hierarchy is very important. And of course, composition is always important. We, we don't even think about it when it comes to language, but of course, we build our statements from more elementary words and the words from more elementary uh, sounds. And so for me, these two facts, together with the fact that, that context-free languages are a natural ensemble for, for real languages, they, they suggested that one should construct a stat mac of language. And I was surprised that nobody else had seemed to have done this before, even though it could have been done any time in the past 60 years, essentially. And so it's really what I want to get to. So the question is really, can we understand something about typical context-free grammars? So context-free grammars, they were introduced in linguistics and in computer science, and they played a role in both of those fields. But they played a role really as mathematical objects. So there, there are proofs about what you can do with these grammars. For example, the, what kind of automatons you need to parse them, as I showed you. And on the computer science side, there are algorithms about, about parsing and about also learning grammars, et cetera. But they're really of the mathematical flavor. And as you know, if you want to prove something, you're essentially proving something about the extreme cases. So say the worst case if you're trying to accomplish some task. Whereas the strength of STATMEC is that if you take very large systems, then we're talking about typical case behavior, which Empirically, in many, in many problems in computer science, it's often much more useful, uh, much more useful uh, uh, technique than to talk about the worst case behavior. So, okay, I need to make things a little bit more precise before I can do this. So the first thing is that if I want to talk about context-free grammars, actually we can assume that, that we have a binary tree. So in this one example here, it's almost binary already, but see there's some word here, some, some uh, factor here where I have a ternary interaction. So it's quite clear that I can make this binary just by redefining interactions and adding some new symbols. And you just do this in an iterative process and eventually you'll get a binary tree. So it's, it's called Chomsky normal form. And so once I've done that, then all the rules are either of, of two kinds. Either I have some hidden variable becomes two others. And I should say that like this, one of the Bs could actually be an A, so we can have uh, recursion. Or you have a rule at the end of the tree where you have some hidden variable becoming some observable. So in the end, you have a relatively simple structure. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is a bit more subtle. So, so far, I've been talking about grammatica grammaticality as, as a yes-no answer, that a sentence is either grammatical or not, which is, which is true. But now, what I want to talk about the ensemble of languages, and what I can do, say, given a grammar, if I want to generate sentences, then in any, for any real language, actually, there's a certain probability that, that given some symbol, it will then use it to, to produce some other symbols. Not all the, the rules in the grammar are used with the same probability. So it's actually convenient to, to instead of go from hard rules, to go to conditional probabilities. And of course, they can be zero or, be zero or one in some extreme cases. So then the objects that that really define what goes on in the grammar are, are these okay, matrix-like objects or tensors, depending on how you like it. So there's an M that takes three, it takes three indices, and an O that takes two. So M, M, A, B, C is that if I have some A, what is the probability that this goes to, to B, C? And this is, okay, the probability that A goes to B, C, given that A goes to some hidden one. So, of course, at some point, you could either become, say, an observable, or you could keep building the tree. So these are really the fundamental uh, objects. Now, okay, it looks a bit complicated, but uh, in the end, it's relatively simple. So for simplicity, let me fix the tree topology so I know where the hidden ones are and I know where the leaves are, just for simplicity. 
Then, okay, these are the objects that I talked about. So now, what we're going to happen is we're going to have is we're going to have sites on the tree that are labeled one, two, three, four, etc. And on each of these sites, I have some hidden variables. So on the the sites here, the internal ones, then I have sigmas. So I have sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, etc. And the string at the end, these are, are O. So I have O1, O2, O3, O4, etc. And so now, okay, the, the way that the these rules actually appear is that I have some probability that sigma i goes to sigma j, sigma k. And it's given that this is uh, in, the, in the interior of the tree. So, okay, this just says that given that these ones are in interior of the tree. So since these are conditional probabilities, what I can do is I can easily construct the probability of an entire configuration just by starting at the top and going down. So as I said, at the top, we have some start symbol that we start with. And then what we can do is just ask, what is the probability that I have sigma 2 and sigma 3 given sigma 1? And that's some probability, and I can work my way down the tree. So the probability of the whole configuration, given the grammar and given the topology of the tree, is just some product over here. Uh, Eric, just to make sure that I follow, for a natural human language, there are only a small, relatively small, finite set of sigmas, right? O could be huge, the set of O. Right, so uh, of course you can apply this in, in any configuration you want. And if you think about words as being the observables, mm -hmm. and the classical, uh, say, nouns, verbs, et cetera, as being the, the categories, then there are not so many. But it's a bit more subtle because in English, you have rules that if I have some verb where I need to change uh, a noun to have an S at the end, then if you want to implement that in the grammar, then you need to multiply some of the rules out and multiply some of the symbols. Mm -hmm. Because as long as you still have a tree structure, you can, you can, have, a, you can have very rich, rich behavior. We can have very rich correlations going down the tree. So really, if you wanted to model all of English uh, syntax, you would need to have, uh, I think, many more symbols, many more hidden variables. But in some cases, don't you have to go back up the tree? Well, if you're talking about parsing? Yeah, so, maybe yeah, so to parse, then actually it's an it's interesting question about whether how we actually parse mentally. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, at least from the computer science point of view, if you want to write a parser to do this, you can write both top-down parsers and bottom-up parsers. They exist. You can write ones that start at the bottom from the left and basically work their way up. And so I think, okay, linguists think that we start at the left and we kind of work our way to the right, but we try to work our way up, and we have to re sometimes we have to revise if necessary. But I won't talk too much about, uh, about the mechanism of parsing. Okay. So there's one subtlety here that this, these M and the O, their probabilities for a fixed grammar. So if I fix a grammar and I want to sample different sentences, there are probabilities. But then what I want to consider is actually an ensemble of grammars. So then the M's and the O's are themselves going to be random objects. So there's two levels of randomness, which, uh, OK, I'm sure you can handle it. So, so what is the physics of, of this kind of model? So as you know, in StatMec, the fundamental object is the free energy, which is just the log of the partition function. So essentially, what I wanted to compute is some object like this. So what is it? So here, I have to integrate over all the grammars. So I have some, some integration measure, dm and then do. I have to sum over all the possible topologies of the tree. And then I have to sum over all the possible configurations of the symbols on the tree. And then this thing here, this is just that conditional probability that I wrote before. And I write it here more like a Boltzmann form. So this Z, even though I can write it quite simply, it contains all the context-free grammars and all grammatical sentences in the universe. So every book that you ever read, if it was grammatical, then it was it's in here. Quite a simple uh, expression. So a little bit more detail. There are some, some subtleties. So these M's and O's are probabilities. So actually, I need to impose normalization of probabilities. So there are some delta functions in there, if you like. And I need some regularization. So I need to say, essentially, how many non-zero rules I have like specifying h bar, essentially. And then, OK, what about this log of p? So it's, what, it's the same thing that I wrote before. If I take logs, then all those products turn into sums. And so I have some sum 
each alpha is like each branching of the tree. So these are the ones in the middle of the tree, and these are the ones at the, at the end. So what we have in the end, it looks, it looks a bit like a spin model. The sigmas are, are some spins. They're like pot spins that can go from one up to however big my alphabet is, and the, similarly for the O's. But there's, there's a subtlety here that makes it uh, more complicated. So the way the notation is that, is that alpha is some, some branch of the tree. Alpha 1 is my notation for the, the site of the tree that's, that's the up part. Alpha 2 is the part down here. Alpha 3 is the part down here. And then on these sites, I have some sigmas. And actually, it's m. You have to take the values of the sigmas and index those into m. So we're used to things like where you have some matrix, and it's indexed into by the sites that you have. So say j, i, j, where the i and j are sites. But here, it's actually m sigma i, something like that. So this is the essential difference between uh, this kind of model and other models that we're used to in physics. So what's actually nice is that remarkably, actually, we can count all the context-free grammars in the universe. So in other words, what we can do is we can do this integral over, over the, uh, the grammars. So what is the miracle? Well, it's essentially the discrete Fourier transform. So I won't show you the details, but it really comes down to that. So then. If I've done that, then all I need to do is sum over all the trees and sum over these spin-like variables, and I have some uh, kind of effective Hamiltonian here. So what is this, what does this interaction actually look like? So what you get is something where alpha and beta are branches of the tree. And what you have here, this is a Kronecker delta. So what it's doing is comparing, it's comparing the sigmas that are on this factor, say, with the ones over here. And it's one if all three of these sigmas are, are the same as these ones in the, right, uh, in the right ordering. So you're comparing and seeing when was the same rules applied at different parts of the tree. And then if those were applied, then it has some, some low energy or large entropy, depending how you want to think about it. And there's some other term involving just the, the spins. So this is the one for the interior of the tree. There's another one for the for the for the branch for the ends, which for the leaves, which looks essentially the same. So in the end, what we're dealing with is something that is basically a POTS model, but it's it's not the usual type because you have this interaction comparing uh, you have multiple spins. But you see that in the end, it's something that it looks like physics. It's something that uh, could have been considered as a statmec model, but wasn't, as far as I know, just because it wasn't derived from anything else. So, okay, there are many questions you can ask. There are things you can do. Use all the standard techniques that you use on this object. You can do uh, like high temperature expansions, et cetera, uh, mean field theory, blah, 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 et cetera, whatever you want. So what can we do with this? So let me start with a kind of fun example. So this is the, the SETI problem. We get some signal from some alien. So I w let me assume that the signal that we, however we got it, we've, we figured out that it's composed of some elementary symbols. and we divide it up into those. So we have this, uh, have this text here. And then the question is, can we learn its language from just from knowing this symbol? So, OK. So what do we want to do? Well, th there are different ways you could try to, try to attack this. So of course, I'm going to assume that it's generated by a context-free grammar. So why would I assume that? Well, uh, as I said, the syntax encodes the constituency between the, yes? Right, okay. Yeah, so I should have mentioned that this is, uh, I'm writing this in a schematic way just to show the simplest uh, form. So, okay, in reality, for many problems, what you want is you have, you want to have some, say, maybe the grammars to be quenched, to be fixed, and then add, have the spins disordered or whatever. And then you have to use replicas, but in the end, you can still play the same game and you can still do the sum. So it will be still the same, uh, you can still do this step, although there, there's going to be more indices floating around. So, yeah, I should have mentioned that, it, that, uh, this is only the kind of the, the simplest possible case, not uh, not the most realistic one for most applications. Okay. Uh, right. So so I'm going to assume that the, the language is generated by a context-free grammar. The the idea being that a context-free grammar is just encoding this, these logical relationships. They have nothing to do particularly with us being humans that we invented these that we use these grammars. Although you could try to debate that. And so one thing we can try to do is to fix this text 
and count how many grammars are, are there for which the text is grammatical. So this kind of, this kind of computation is usually called a Gardner volume computation after Elizabeth Gardner who did these kind of computations starting in the 80s, actually in the context of neural networks. And so you see the idea that, okay, L is going to be some dimensionless measure of how long my text is. And what do we expect to happen? If I have only a very short text, say like the first 10 characters here, then even if the grammar is very simple, there's no way that I'm going to be able to learn all the, all the rules of the grammar from such a short text. There's going to be some huge number of grammars for which those are grammatical. Whereas as I increase the length of text, then there are more and more constraints that are, that are imposed by the order in the text, even though I can't really see it uh, naively. And so it seems that there are two things that can happen. Either this can go down, down to 1 at some finite uh, L. So if we assume that the context-free grammar was generated by, sorry, if the text was generated by a context-free grammar, then okay, the lowest this can be is 1, when there's just one grammar possible. And then there's some critical point L star. Or in the thermodynamic limit, it could happen that, that this just goes slowly down uh, and only approaches, uh, only approaches 1 at infinity. We don't really know what, what, what will happen. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we have to make assumptions on the measure, so you can play with it a little bit, but uh, but yes. Uh. <laughs> okay. So. Oh, okay. So this is the problem. I'm working now on the full solution. I was hoping to have it done for you now, but I think it's going to take uh, another week or two to finish. But what I can tell you is that what is the right measure here? So this is something that you, you could have guessed, that if the length of the text is L, then the right way to measure L is to compare it with the number of degrees of freedom in the grammar. Because if this, if this capital L is very large, you, you should have enough information to be able to learn the grammar, whereas if it's small, you shouldn't. The non-trivial thing is, of course, computing what is this L star, or whether it just uh, decays slowly to infinity or not. So, uh, so in principle, you can do the computation where you also sum over all the trees. Then uh, you can still write down the problem, but it's more complicated. But you can do it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, as I said, I'm, I'm working on the full solution. What I can tell you is that if you take some simple approximation that that is certainly wrong, it's not the right problem, but it's okay. It's uh, how would you say morally correct? Then the result that you get is equivalent to Gardner's result for the perceptron. So it's a bit uh, surprising, but in the end, the equations are really exactly mappable from one onto the other. And then she showed actually what happens exactly, and a lot of things have been studied, uh, including by some members of the audience. And then you have this scenario here that you have some critical points where, say, if I fix the threshold that I want to say, uh, I want to count grammars for which the, the uh, probability of the text being grammatical is is uh, is uh, above some threshold, then it really goes to zero. We we know the shape of this curve, etc. So okay, that was one kind of toy problem, but there are, are problems that I think are are quite uh, potentially full of applications that are that are okay at least related to that and, and otherwise. So one is one is very closely related. So this is about ambiguity. So here, okay, forget about the alien. Just think that. I have some, some grammar that I know, some, some typical grammar that I fix, and I want to ask for a typical sentence, how many grammatical parses are there? So if there's only one, then the sentence is unambiguous. If there's more than one, then the sentence is ambiguous, and if there are zero, then it's ungrammatical. And it's known that natural languages are typically ambiguous. So for example, here's an example. Two cars were reported stolen by the Groverton police yesterday. So you, you see that there are two. In Steven Pinker's book, he has a lot of uh, newspaper headlines where they've done this kind of mistake that he finds amusing. Here's another one that also from the book Okay, that's uh, quite funny. You can discuss, discuss sex with Jon Stewart or discuss sex with Jon Stewart. 
meaning something different. And actually, here you can see the difference in the tree. So there's some difference here at the top of the tree. Although otherwise they're the same. So, okay, so what situation is this then? It's not, it's really not obvious. If you start with, with a very small, uh, small sentence, then, okay, you need some certain amount of, of symbols in the sentence in order to even have the possibility of becoming ambiguous. So it should go up when n is small. But then what happens at large L? To me, it's really not clear whether, whether it will go to zero, whether it slowly decays to zero or it goes to zero at some finite number, even, what, even whether it increases. This is a different n from the uh, two transparencies ago. This is restricting to one language. Yes, yes, yeah. sorry. It's a different n. Yes. 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 Yeah, you fix you fix the grammar, sample from the grammar, and you want to ask typically are, is the sentence very very ambiguous or not? And I think it's interesting in res with respect to natural languages because, like I said, natural languages are known to be ambiguous. But if they were extremely ambiguous, then it would be very hard for us to to parse meaning. We'd have to use a lot of other information to understand what's going on. Whereas if they were extremely unambiguous, then it would not be very uh, efficient. But this is sort of slightly skewed, but in both languages, parsing can be ambiguous in order to elevate them above the kind of just stating the obvious thing. I mean, you know, it's probably because all the speech is philosophy, all the language is so sort You know, if you want, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's precisely that, you know, and I can tell you a lot of philosophers, you know, where it's, they kind of can be speaking. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, I'm not saying this as a sort of derogatory, you know, it's, it's poetry, you know, symbols is poetry, kind of, is that is also, you know, that's what makes this poetry kind of interesting, as opposed to, yes. you know, some other modern poetry which speaks in constantly something. I mean, you know, this is something that these languages do have and that gives them the spice, actually, in a way, the kind of spice. Right. Yes, so, okay, so of course, one way that you can do what you say is to, to add new nouns, which there are some philosophers that like to do that. And then these nouns that don't maybe mean anything. And, uh, you don't, but you don't have to. And, uh, yes, OK. And I agree that, that certainly, as I said, it's known for real languages that, that uh, typical languages are ambiguous. So uh, it seems to be a fact. OK. So this is another problem that you could try to ask and answer. I haven't done yet, but I'm, I'm working on it. Yeah, so I'm fixing some grammar, so it's well defined for a given sentence, whether it's grammatical or not. Just like the first ones that I showed you with Chomsky. Once I fix the grammar, it's a yes-no question, whether that's grammatical or not. So, okay, doing the parse, that's another problem but that I'm not, that I'm not talking about, but it, it's well defined whether it's grammatical or not. Okay. Then there are other things maybe more ambitious. For example, what about the phase diagram? What is the phase diagram of languages? So in particular, are human languages atypical or not? And it's something that, from a quantitative point of view, we don't really know. There are most studies that I've seen where people are looking at quite simple quantities like uh, Zipf's law, it's, the, it's like the frequency distribution of words. It, everything seems to be pretty similar when you look across different languages. But they're not very refined measures because there hasn't been really any good theory that gives you, tells you what to look at. So maybe we could find something more interesting looking at, uh, looking more quantitatively. And then going back to my interest at the, at the beginning, which is about trying to really teach machines to learn. So one way that you could try to use this type of approach is to think about what is the optimal architecture to learn highly compositional functions. Because essentially what we're doing with language is using that, using language to build uh, statements that are, that are highly compositional. And then going to natural language process, processing, how can we best incorporate syntax into neural network approaches? So until about 10 years ago, the best, uh, the best methods that were used to, for natural language processing were using context-free grammars. And then there was this deep learning revolution. And then now a lot of people are using essentially kind of uh, black box deep learning uh, approaches. So starting from the, the, what I talked about at the beginning of the, of the, 
of the lecture. And okay, adapting it for language, but not, not very much. And I think one question now is that we're seeing that the machines that we're trying to teach to do to, to learn language, they can learn correlations between words. So they can learn some simple structure. But they, they cannot answer these, these kind of questions that I showed you before that really involve uh, both a logical element, because you have to understand the syntax of the language, and also semantics. So the ones that I showed you before are quite tricky in that you have to build the tree, the syntactical tree, but you also have to understand the, the semantic dependency between the, the, the different quantities, which is really not trivial. So I think now, in the next few years, we're going to start to see people where they're trying to take both approaches and really try to combine them. So, um, so one thing you could try to do, for example, is if you have a neural network approach, what you do is you take a neural network and you make it run in time, so it has some memory of the past, but otherwise it's like the, the neural network that I showed you. And now what you can do is you say that, you can say with the neural network, what I want to do is, is not just run a simple neural network, but I want you to build a tree as you do it. So I want you to build a syntactical tree. And this is something that is now being done, and it shows that people have shown at Stanford you get quite good performance on natural language processing tasks if you do this, because it starts to build some of the, the hierarchical structure that's important in language. Yeah? So uh, the syntactical tree and the semantic, semantic tree have independent trees? Okay, so for syntax, you have uh, context-free grammars. For semantics, there's not really an accepted way about how to formalize it. It's not like context-free grammars where it's really clear what is the right way. So there are different grammars. They don't build trees, usually. Either they don't build anything that you can draw or that nobody figured out how to draw. They're just some set of abstract rules and really very mathematical. Or there's one, if you look at dependency, so in the example that I showed you before where you have some pronoun that has to relate to some other noun in the sentence, there are people that just, they build a structure where it just connects like pronouns to, to nouns and things like that. But it's not really a tree. So it's not, there's not some accepted, actually, accepted way about how to represent semantics. It's debated even in linguistics. There are different uh, approaches and things like that. But of course, one way to do it would be, would be to say that the neural networks, they can build this kind of uh, uh, fuzzy network that knows about all the different uh, nouns, what they actually mean, how they relate to other things. That's what we see with something like image recognition, that it can do these tasks that involve uh, relating some object to another. What they're bad at is really doing the logical structure part. So it might be enough just to build something doing building logical structure with a uh, kind of black box deep neural network. And we'll see the, the fruits of that as time goes on. And then, okay, maybe with this kind of formulation that I showed you, can we use tools of disordered physics to help learn languages? So there are people that are, uh, as I said, trying to use uh, disordered physics to, uh, to help with deep neural networks, and we can try to do the same here. Then, okay, I'll return to this point that I've already mentioned, that syntax isn't everything. So there's a fun example from also from Pinker's book. Like, think about how hard, how many logical steps you need to do to figure out who is he in this very simple dialogue, where Alice says, I'm leaving you, and Bob says, who is he? <laughs> so <laughs> really, I mean, it's enough that you, you see that uh, uh, Semantics is uh, not, not so simple. Okay, so now I go back to the point that I just mentioned. Is there a physical approach to semantics? So there, there are grammars uh, that are out there, but uh, they seem to be quite abstract, not used so much, so I'm not sure. So really with that, I want to, to conclude. So I tried to show you at the beginning that successful machine learning architectures are compositional and hierarchical, although maybe people will, will debate that. And Natural languages also have these two features. So I didn't make any connection between the two, just that one motivated the other. And it's really not obvious what is actually the, the correct connection, because maybe you would, na naively you would think that if we have machine learning architectures that have these features, they should be good at learning problems where those features are, are built in, but they don't do that well for languages, so that's still open. I showed you that context-free grammars define a simple model for, for hierarchical structure. Maybe the simplest model. They're a very good model because, as I said, there are a lot of results that are already known about them. So there are things, for example, you can just get off the shelf highly efficient parsers for context-free grammars that have been studied by computer scientists. And then 
there is an ensemble of grammars, so this defines what I call the random language model. So I didn't show you details, but, uh, but it's something that I think has a lot of potential. And the statmec problem, it's not trivial, which is good. And, but it's also not intractable. It's not uh, impossibly complicated. So I think it's something that, that could be uh, studied by physicists. So mathematical linguistics has been around for, for 60 years, since, since Chomsky's time. And I think it's time for physical linguistics. So finally, I'd like to thank my colleagues at ENS and elsewhere in Paris. So Remy Monasson, who is here and talking tomorrow, as well as Jorge Kirchhoff, Francesco Zamponi, uh, Guillaume Samergia, and Pier Francesco Urbani. So thank you. Right, so uh, something that I didn't really talk about at all is that there's a huge debate in linguistics about uh, universal grammar. So the extent to which this context-free grammar and our ability to, to learn syntax very well is really something that is biological. So that's kind of Chomsky's contention and, and uh, other people who don't think so. And it seems that people are maybe converging that there is some part that's biological because we have certain areas in the brain that are used much more for language than others, but that other parts are part of more general processing capability, capabilities. So then, if, if that's if it's like that, then any object that is that is uh, any uh, entity that's that's doing a lot of computation, it might end up in the same same uh, position because what we've seen is that all over the world we have this huge number of grammars, huge number of languages that have developed independently. For humans, right, right. So, of course, but if so, if it's if the reason that the languages are alike is because of universal grammar, then then uh, I cannot say anything about non-humans. But if it's only because of our universal computation abilities, then it could be that this is just you know the way that we process the world. So uh, I can't really say anything more intelligent than that. But it's an interesting question, of course. Jim has a question. A lot of people's questions. Uh, can you discuss the evolution? So it's a good question. Uh, I can't answer it. And uh, I know that there are some people looking at the evolution of language, not exactly with the same model, but uh, with more kind of uh, naive models and trying to understand uh, what's going on. Uh, Okay, so when you try to answer some question like uh, like the, the SETI problem, you can ask what is the probability that the, the okay, uh, how many grammars are there for which the probability that the sentences, the text is grammatical is above some threshold? So then you allow for errors and, and, and you allow that. The way that I, but the way that I put the, drew that partition function, actually what plays the role of temperature is, is really, uh, how complicated is the grammar? So the stupidest grammar is when whatever symbol I have, then I, the next one is just ch chosen from some uniform distribution. Then it's the, the, really the stupidest grammar. And you know that it's not like that in real life. You have, 
if you have a noun phrase, then that noun phrase can become something that's like a noun and something else or whatever. There's a few possibilities, but not infinitely many. So actually, it's the, the, roughness, in the, the roughness of the grammar, which is related to temperature. So the high temperature limit is the simple limit, as usual, and the low temperature limit is the rough, complicated one. Right, right, right. So you can have uh, you can have a word that's spelled the same, but that's the output of different rules for its different possible uh, different possible uses. So it's really the point that syntax isn't everything. That you have you have words that appear as the output of trees, but uh, starting from something that's say a noun or something else. Uh, I don't think I get what you're, what you're saying. You can have ambiguous parses, right? You can take a sentence, and there can be different parses depending on, for this word, I don't even know if it's, a, if, if it's playing the role of a noun or something else in this, uh, in this particular sentence. Oh, we have a question from Mark, but I, I like to say that in the colloquia that I post, I like to encourage some of the students to ask questions in the moment, because they're usually Well, the main symmetry is that the elements that I'm that are in the problem are are symbols that don't mean anything. They're only symbols. They're arbitrary, and so you have a permutation symmetry, which is an enormous group. And actually, the reason that I could do this miracle to to actually count all the grammars is I, I use the Fourier transform because the the uh, uh, translational group is a, a subgroup of the permutation group. So it's used there, and then once you sum over the grammars, then actually the reason why it takes a relatively simple form where I have these POS interactions is because those interactions, they cannot favor any particular symbol. So I have, you know, I, I showed you what I have is something there. You compare this symbol here to this symbol here. It doesn't matter what the actual value of the symbols is. It's just like information theory that, you know, you can only, you can't use what the, the symbols are, you can only use the distribution, this kind of thing. Yes, exactly. Precisely. Okay, any questions from young people? Uh, no? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, good. He is a student. <laughs> uh, when you were talking about the minimum length of a message you need to pin down the, the grammar, yeah. it would seem to me that I can always add more grammatical rules which would ambiguate the question, so there shouldn't be those automatic patterns. Right, right. So actually, yeah, I shoved some things under the carpet, so what you have to do is specify how many degrees of freedom you have, and then you can answer it. So what, in practice, what you would do is you would, you would start from the simplest ones, and you'd add more and more symbols, and you should, have, you should see some signature when you're at the, the, uh, uh, if, at the true uh, number of symbols that you have in the grammar. But it's an interesting problem, and it's something that you could easily test just by you know, generating a random grammar and trying to, to do the problem. That would be fun. Okay, if there's no further questions,